I want to welcome Agile XRM to the podcast. I've known the people at Agile XRM for the past 12 years. I've seen how their business process management tool can add massive value to complex organizational processes in sectors such as finance and government. If you have complex processes or a need for dialogues on the Power Platform or Dynamics 365, take a look at how this BPM tool can add value. You can find them at agilexrm.com or check out the show notes for more details. Welcome to the Power Platform Show. Thanks for joining me today. I hope today's guest inspires and educates you on the possibilities of the Microsoft Power Platform. Now, let's get on with the show. Today's guest is from the United Kingdom uh, in London. You can clarify that in a moment. He's a director at PwC. Uh, A piece of advice you'd give a 17-year-old self is do not be afraid to change something if it, if it, if it what? If it does not feel right, you only get one chance to do something in life. And so therefore it's got to feel right. Otherwise change it. You can find links for to his bio in the show notes, uh, social media, et cetera, for this episode. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you, Mark. Good to be here. Good to have you on the show. Tell me, I always like to get to know my guests from a, a, a non-commercial perspective. In other, in other words, non-career, non-business perspective. So for you, what does that mean? What does food, family, fun mean for you? So I'll start with family. So um, I live in South Wales in the UK. So although I spend a lot of my time in central London, I actually live on the complete opposite side of the country in the Mm. least technological part of the country uh, that I possibly could do. Um, I'm married with four children, which keep me really busy all the time, um, with three dogs, including one dog, which is 80-odd kilos in weight, like a little horse, uh, one cat, three tortoises. And just before the pandemic... We used to have 20 chickens that looked like Muppets. So um, we've got a little farmstead going on over there. Let's, uh, let's put it that way. So um, about as non-technical as you could possibly get um, from my private life, if that makes sense. How many acres have you got? Uh, it's, it's not very much. We've, 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 got about a, we've got about an acre and a half just um, in, the, in the garden. We, we keep lots of pets. It keeps busy, keeps my wife busy, keeps the kids busy, and um, supplies us with lots of eggs. So um, it's... I bet. Uh, Always helps, yeah. Although you you you'd be amazed at the cost of one of these eggs, because keeping your own chickens by the time you fed them, housed them, nurtured them, it's probably I'm probably paying about five pounds for a single egg. You know when? Wow, it's, <laughs> it's a bit ridiculous, really. I thought you know I think we're at a dollar ten at the moment in New Zealand for eggs because there's been a a shortage and. Um, you know, new rules around the way they're farmed, et cetera, have meant there's this massive shortage now of all the laws have come in around them. And I think at a dollar ten that's an expensive egg, especially when I make a lot of cocktails and um I use I use egg whites in them quite a bit. So it just pops the price of the drink up and that's not even the spirits. I, I imagine listeners to your podcast weren't expecting to uh, have a, a small conversation about the price of eggs at the beginning. But uh, exactly, exactly. What hobbies do you have? So I'm a big photography fan, um, and doing a lot of travelling in the job that I do, I, I try and take the camera with me um, as much as I possibly can. Um, I'm a big analog photography fan, so I'll often be seen with a, you know, one of these little single use plastic film cameras that you can get for a for, for a few pounds um and i'll i'll grab those no one's going to steal that you know you're never going to get mugged with a plastic four dollar camera if that makes sense so i'll take that with me and, and normally some of the best photos I've, I've had of my team when we've been out and we've been doing whatever we've been doing with clients have always been from those little cheap plastic cameras um, they all come in photos and of course no one does proper printed photos anymore so there's a little novelty you know, yeah. of handing these little things out and everyone's sort of taking their own. Yeah, it's great fun. But, but do you then have your more upscale? Do you, do you have, are you a Sony uh, or, a, or a Canon or a, a Nikon fan? What's, what's your preference? I do, I do. So I have all the, the, the possible configurations of Canon equipment, whether that be digital, film, mirrorless. Um, and I'll try and carry one of those with me. But do you know that the, the quality of the cameras on, on a phone these days is is, is just it's just amazing and and the fact that i can i can take a photo upload it to instagram get it on 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 all of my you know sort of online content really quickly 
uh, just the workflow of that is fantastic. So love doing a lot of that. Um, if, if I'm not taking photos or traveling from work, I'm, I'm a big DIY nut. So um, anything in the home that I can fix myself or take four or five years to fix myself rather than pay for someone to do it, you know, over the course of maybe a day, um, I'm, I'm there. I, I've, I've got things unfinished throughout every part of my house, and I'm so pleased with every single one of them. <laughs> so do you have a lot of power tools? I, I'd like to think so, and, and most of them um, are used once and, and, and look amazing. You know, yeah. anything that, that's got sort of, you know, a big brand and maybe you can, you can wear a tool belt with it. You know, you have to yep. have a tool belt on in order to use the tool. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm there. And, and, and I'll use it once and I think, you know what, I now need something else. I need, a, I need, I need a, you know, some form of other saw, drill, hammer, whatever it is, I'll, 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 I'll get that. And um, it drives my wife bananas because, you know, it will genuinely take me two or three years to put a shelf up or fix a door or, or any of those things. But it doesn't matter. I'm doing it myself. It's stimulating. It's not technology. It's a, it's a good outlet for the technologist right. to pick up something analog and break like something. It. It's great. Fun. Like it. So you say you, you live in South Wales, is that right? It's correct, yeah. So um, other side of the UK from, from yeah. London. What do you do about summer there? As in, <laughs> <laughs> we, when we, I went we, to Wales on holiday and I just came straight from Portugal at the time and it was middle of summer. I got there and it was a wet, dreary day. And I was like, what's happened to summer? You, you, know, you know, Mark, in, if you go on holiday in Wales, you know, most parts of the world, you can take your speedos and it's like your second skin when you're in the sea. It's fantastic. Yep. In Wales, you know, it's more like your second cardigan, if that makes sense. You know, you need something warm and if you're going to go and pack, you know, if you're a, you're a lady and you're packing your bikini, you, you're packing a cardigan, a set of wellies, and a, and a, and a waterproof at the same time. It, we have our week of sunshine, and <laughs> what more do you want? You know, it's all about timing, eh? <laughs> it's, it's, it is all about timing. You've got to go in June. In June, it's fantastic. June is amazing. Rest of the year, though, yeah, it's it's pretty damp. <laughs> and so, are you a native speaker? Absolutely not. No, I'm. I'm. I'm from Watford. Um, I'm about as far removed from from being Welsh as possible. But it's such a beautiful part of the world, and mm. you can, you know, you can, you can. Great thing is, I can, I can walk my dogs. Um, I can go out with the kids, and within five minutes, I can be up in the mountains and mm. just seeing these most spectacular views. And and better still, you can you can get in a car. And drive up to the top of the mountain and still experience these magnificent views without yeah. casting a single bead of sweat on your forehead. It's um, it's it's fabulous, fabulous part of the world to live. And at the same time, I can get into London, hour and a half. I can be in the metropolis. I can do the thing that you need to do, and then hour and a half later, I'm back in the hills. I'm relaxed. Yeah. It's it's just, it's just a wonderful up. existence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just a wonderful existence. Excellent, excellent. Tell me about your career choice and what you do and how you got into what you currently do. So when I set out in my journey, uh, if I'm honest, goat farming was, was way more attractive than technology for me. It was, um, it was sort of a, a, an industry that I fell into and started out as, a, as a, the most bizarre route into technology. So mm. I actually started out running a business, got involved in doing a lot of technology delivery, running that business. Ended up um, working in infrastructure and system engineering, sorting out servers and exchange um, infrastructure and Active Directory and TCP IP and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ended up delivering some some work with SharePoint. Found this thing called CRM. And this was in back in the day of CRM three and I thought this is this is fantastic. I like this. I can I reckon we can we can do a lot with this. Um, so got involved in doing a little bit of work with the CRM um, platform. Ended up going to work for a company called Cyber. That was also happened to be the organization where the great and the good of the Microsoft community also were working. So I was working with Scott Giroux, Andy Bibby, and a, and a whole bunch of others back in the day um, delivering CRM projects. So CRM 3, CRM 4, 2011. Oh, my gosh. What a, what a time to be alive when we had workflows that you could edit without having to you know, remote desktop into the server. It was um, spectacular. 
and then and then of course when Microsoft changed the um, uh, all of the .NET classes, so you know the billions of lines of code that we we're all writing at the time all need to be refactored. That was a that was a high high moment in the in my career. So I ended up moving into software engineering where I spent probably most of my career writing software and writing writing applications. Four years ago, I thought, you know what, I'm at the I'm at about as far as I can go with technology. Mm-hmm. Why don't I try? Why don't I try leadership? Why don't I try and go and build a practice, get involved in the commercials? So I've been with um, with PwC for four years now. Um, big four organization, um, very very different working in that sort of environment to the traditional sort of system integrator, and it's been a great challenge. And it's been a great challenge in the sense that I'm able to do what I love, which is deliver technology. But I'm able to do that where I've got all of these other disciplines that I can call upon, you know, behavioral analytics, um, op model transformation, strategy, mm. research, all of this stuff that I never, never had an opportunity to work with. And I can combine that with delivering technology. And the rest is, is sort of sort of history. We, we've grown from strength to strength. We've, we've come from a very, very small team in the UK now to a to a powerhouse um, in the UK firm. So. I do miss Visual Studio. I do miss, you know, spending my days not in endless meetings. But at the same time, I recognize that in the job that I'm doing now, I can empower so many other people to do all the things that I found really interesting early on in my career. And so, so PwC is a business. Uh, I take it runs on a similar model to all the top four accountings where each country is autonomous in its own right and, and therefore the business, your practice would sit in the UK. You're, you're not doing projects into Europe, US. Asia, anything like that? Or do you have, um, like, for example, KPMG, they had that model, but for their power practice, they kind of brought the strategic leaders together all around the world and then kind of yeah. set a operating model that all the great minds, mainly, you know, a lot of them being MVPs and the such, came together and really built that target operating model that they would use then when they went into the individual customers yeah. they worked with. Are you, are you working on a similar thing or are you totally unattached to the rest of the, the um, Microsoft biz app practices inside PwC worldwide? So it's a journey, right? So we have globally, we have approximately 16,000 people um, with Microsoft certifications with, you know, actively practicing, um, the different territories globally are all at different stages with their Microsoft journey. You, I suppose you have to remind, like all the big four, because we have audit relationships with different technology practices, there's only, there's, we can't work with everyone. People exactly. are quite fortunate in that we can work with, with all the big ones. And as a result, we do. Um, and because we do, we spend a lot of time almost with a bit of sort of Batman versus Superman. You know, is it Dynamics? Is it Salesforce? Yes. It's, it's, there's an element of it sort of Coke and Pepsi in, in the sense that they both do pretty much the same thing. You know, what cloud do you want, guys? You know, um, so, so, so to answer your question, yeah, we, we do sort of work in that way, but you're absolutely right. Every geography is its own independent firm that collaborates in a network of firms. So when it comes to, to, to technology and technology implementation and technology choice, it, it, it really is down to the individual territory about how they want to roll these things out. But yeah. we all adhere to sort of a centralized um, set of methodologies, if that makes sense. Yeah. In what you're doing day to day now with your customers, are you seeing an index more strongly to Dynamics implementations? And and when I say Dynamics 365, I'm talking about everything from the ERP side of things, including Business Central, through to, to of course, the, the range of products with sales, marketing, customer service, field service, et cetera. Or are you seeing a a greater index towards the power platform? And and I'll, I'll preface my question is that I'm seeing that the seeding that Microsoft has done through the M365 licensing, whether it be um, <clears throat> the E3 or the E5 Cal, has definitely opened up a world of people, you know, building solutions on the power platform before they even really know what the power platform is. And similar to, you know, what we've seen in the past, where if you got access bundled with your office suite, all of a sudden you had a need for a database, and so you built one, right? Excel similar. Yes. What, what are you seeing in the market? Is Because, you know, I'm aware that in the UK, Microsoft has just recently, 
knocked a bunch of dynamic sellers out of Microsoft on the head. You know, so it seems like they're pulling back in that market from a dynamics perspective, but I'm still seeing a massive index on the power platform side. What are you seeing? It's it's really it's a really interesting question. So in this day and age where we've got cost of living crises all over the place and we've got everyone with a, a really keen eye on cost, there's a big sort of drive in a lot of the clients that we're working with around what can I actually do and how far can I go just using Power Platform? And then when does the cost benefit of spending capital cost in terms of building a solution in Power Platform, nurturing and maintaining it, when does that start and end? And actually, the power of an off-the-shelf dynamics product, customer service, sales, et cetera, et cetera, more so in the, I'd say more so in the C space than the ERP space. The ERP space is, is pretty repeatable. It's pretty predictable. It's, yeah. you're not, you're not going to replace an ERP platform overnight with Power, with power App. You've got you've got to recognize the horses for courses, if that makes sense. But certainly in CE, customer service is, is the, the one where everyone's like, well, I, come on, I can, I can build a Power App. And I can push that power out to the nth level. I'm, I'm having lots of conversations with clients that say, well, actually, that's great. But what about when you want to do email to case? What about when you want to do um, something with SLAs? When, 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 when do you want to then start to use sort of omni-channel and all these other added value components? That's the point where your power app sort of starts and ends. But there's no reason why you can't continue to use the, the power of the power platform in combination with what you're delivering in dynamics. Um, so I'm actually seeing far more sort of, I don't want to use the term hybrid, but certainly more emphasis on, look, we've got Power Platform and Dataverse as the base, and we've then got the first-party apps, the, the sales, marketing, et cetera, et cetera, for those specific use cases that we need it. And, and actually, we still want the power of Power Platform to allow us to solve a lot of the, the, the edge case problems that we would otherwise reach for Excel or go and buy something off the shelf that might do, I don't know, 70% of what we actually need. You know, yeah. there's, there's, there's a huge focus, I think, on, and there's a lot of untapped focus, I think, in people that have problems in the way in which they, um, they're running their business. I, I always refer to those problems as sort of low value activity. You know, if you're a, you're a staffer running a team of people, how can you make sure that your people can focus on high value activity? And high value activity for me would be the correct use of automation, having an app to do specific things that someone is manually doing or someone is using a combination of different Excel spreadsheets or whatnot. Having access then to the first party apps to take a huge swathe of functionality or a huge swathe of, sorry, of problems away from people. Giving people the creativity, sorry, giving people access to tooling that allows them to use their creativity in conjunction with those first-party apps, tends to be where people are at at the moment. Um, yeah. So I think it's I think it's a I think it's a mix. I think you're right. There is a shift to power platform. Power platform is often the the the, the entry point, the starting point for something much bigger. Are you seeing across your customer base customers coming to you <clears throat> that? know that they need to invest in a low-code solution. They, and, you know, often it's app modernization is one of the driving things. Another thing that I see driving it is lack of visibility of solutions inside their business that have been built outside of IT. And so we can take, you know, macro-rich Excel spreadsheets and that. We can take uh, third-party SaaS solutions that have been bought on your personal credit card because it's solve the problem, right? Not your personal credit, your corporate credit card is what yeah, I typically yeah. see. And then the other one is, surprisingly, there's still a proliferation of access databases that yes. have been copied a thousand times and been forked as they went to different departments. And there's, and, and what I'm seeing is that there's this risk to companies around one, if there's a ransomware attack on the business and you've yeah. got a database sitting on a shared, whether, you know, network location, there's risk, right? That somebody sees that, locks it down um, or leaks it. We had two major leaks in the Australian market last year where a ransomware attack and they thought they would play hardball with the ransomware folks and the patient data was healthcare was one of them massive it ended up people had to renew their passports and things because 
that type of ID identification, um, people's medical scenarios all put online. You know, imagine how how much of a breach of trust that that has been. So, and then you've got low code. This concept of and and you know, one of the questions is: Are we just providing a tool set that's just access on steroids or Excel on steroids? How do you have those conversations that and 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 I suppose show to particularly the security conscious folks and the admin folks inside organizations that they're not creating another lot of shambles that they have don't have their arms around. Really interesting question. And 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 I don't you know for for, for those of you who remember the the rise of SharePoint in the in the mid to late noughties where everyone wanted a SharePoint site and all of a sudden you've got the wild west of SharePoint where documents are copied 20 times over and there's no records management, it's chaos. There is a danger, I think, with, with tools like Power Platform that without the right level of governance in an organization, you can end up in that situation where you have absolutely no control. You know, someone's discovered the default environment and it, all of a sudden there's flows everywhere. There's model-driven apps here. There's Canvas apps there. It's chaos. We're, we're certainly, certainly from our own journey. So as an organization, we, we use lots of different cloud technologies, Power Platform being one of them. When we, when we were um, looking to roll out Power Platform, one of the key things that certainly we as an organization did, and I think a lot of our clients are doing it almost in the opposite way is we wanted to make sure that the choice of using a tool like Power Platform was a business decision that mm-hmm. has genuine material business value, not an IT decision that says, hey, we've got these licenses, we should use them to replace Excel. Now, don't get me wrong, the IT aspect of it was definitely a, um, a driver to get away from situations where we've got lots of Excel spreadsheets scattered around. We've got isolated, um, isolated, highly business critical files that, as you say, can be open to ransomware attacks, can be open to data exfiltration, can be open to all manner of different vulnerabilities. Um, our decision was mainly around business and getting business value. And the business value for us was that we've got it's an interesting organization in, in that we have three scenarios that we would use Power Platform for. One is for internal tooling, that allow staff to focus on high value activity, as I, as I mentioned before. The <laughs> second one would be um, engaging with our clients. So if you look at our tax line of service, for example, the way that tax tends to work is we gather a whole bunch of information from a client. We take it away. We do stuff with it, number crunch, and we hand it back. When we do that, um, those sort of the tools that we would use to do that lend itself really well to yeah. power apps and power platform. And then the third scenario that we would have, and this is probably unique to us, is we want to build an asset that we can then reuse as an accelerator or as a as a piece of intellectual property that, that add value to a client engagement. So so we have three scenarios that we'd use power platform for. And all three of those scenarios are have a business lens associated with them, have a real strong business ROI that we can tangibly measure and and actually actively promote, if that makes sense. So, so once we've got the business case and we've got buy-in from leadership and everyone's over the moon, Power Platform's the right thing to do, we then get into the technology. And how do we how do we successfully roll out a tool set like Power Platform in a global enterprise where every territory has their own legal constraints, their own data um, rules, their own regulatory uh, requirements they have their own ways of doing things even how do we provide a global consistent approach to managing the technology but still then provide the local technology teams with the right level of configuration to allow them to tailor the solution to their specific geography and the one thing you know that 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 challenge has been huge we've we've had everything from how do we how do we choose even to use Power Platform? You know, I've got ten different cloud technologies I can use: Mendix, Appian, Power Platform. Which one do I go with? We've we've worked really hard to sort of identify the key strengths and key use cases for each of those tools, and then to have a process where someone can submit an idea, and we can take that idea and then start to evaluate what just what is the right tool set to use, and then 
once you've chosen a tool set, what's the stack? What's that golden stack that we as an organization would, would focus on? Is it dataverse driven model? Sorry, is it dataverse model driven apps? Is it dataverse and canvas apps? Is it SQL and a canvas app? Is it a combination of all of them? It, you know, what, what do we do? How do we provide some guidance? And then, you know, there's what, 800, 900 connectors now. How do we, how do we choose the, how do we grade those connectors in terms of risk? You know, how do we identify the connectors that someone can just use? Just here, knock yourself out. You can use it versus connectors that will never see the light of day in an organization like, like ours, if that makes sense. Yeah. So we've graded all of the connectors, sort of red, amber, green. We've got a, 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 a use case um, uh, evaluation tool so that when someone has an idea and they submit the idea and they talk about what, you know, what's the sort of the architecture of the solution, how do I then choose which connectors um, you can use if it's an amber connector you know you need to make a business case for that you need to justify why you're going to use that connector and and, and prove to us that yeah. um the choice of that connector isn't going to um incur any any kind of risk if that makes sense so 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 just going back to your original question you know i think it is a it ha- the choice of using a tool set like power platform has to be driven by a business need a business a, a business requirement a business outcome that's then empowered by the technology teams and, yeah. and those technology teams shape the way in which that technology is then rolled out to switch gears slightly <clears throat> tell us about how from a, a people leadership perspective and in running a practice uh, and a competency around you know delivering outcomes to customers using either the dynamic suite or the power platform suite of products. How do you assess individuals in your organization and their ongoing, you know, our clients always expect us to be one step ahead of them, right? They, they need to know, like if they're going to talk about something in the wave release, they expect the consultant to know about it. Right. And yeah. how do you um, create a culture of like what Microsoft has of learn it all? right? That you need to be constantly learning. And I don't know what your thoughts are on certification, but of course, uh, as a Microsoft partner, Microsoft pretty much incents their partners to be certified and go through to some degree a box ticking exercise with that. But how do you make sure that your consultants, however you take them on or whatever stage you take them on in their career, are going to the next level that at the end of a year, they haven't just gained, a, you know, because I see so many consultants and I see so many CVs come across my head and what they show me is no personal development. Yeah. They show me, yeah, I learned this on the project because the customer had a need. And I'm like, you're like a rudderless ship. You just go whatever <laughs> you've got something to do here. So you learn that. And there's no kind of, I just see, you know, if you were a doctor in a medical profession and you're making money at the level of a doctor, you have ongoing education. Like, you know where your career is going. You know, yeah. if you're going to drill deeper in this, you, you, it's not a case of, no, I'm just doing the next job. And yet I'm seeing so many consultants coming through with this absolute lack of career direction because there's yeah. a shortage of resource in the market. They are just bumping them with another 10 grand on what they're making and they know that they're never going to get at their current employer. And like most employers, as in particularly at the high end of the market that we operate in, they do not give pay rises without somebody giving up a heart or a lung or something like that in the management team to make that a reality. So therefore they know, okay, we, what we do, we've got to switch companies. And so they switch company and I get these bland CVs come to me and I'm just like, wait, I don't even want to employ you because it just shows your kind of ethic, your you, you've got no control of your career. You're just in it to, you know, basically go and eat your lunch and uh, get your paycheck. And I don't see this kind of career vision and stuff. And I don't know, should I be expecting it? Or, or do people not care these days? How, how do you deal with that as a, as a leader? Really interesting question. And, 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 and I can relate to just about everything you said from, from my, my time in the system integration market, where, you know, you're, the focus is on you being utilized and you being billable and you yep. being, you're, you're basically doing whatever the client is coming up with. And there's virtually no incentive for you to 
have any kind of self-development, whether that be from a technology standpoint, mm. how do I learn about all the new stuff coming through? How do I keep myself up to date? But also from a personal development, you know, how do I respond to feedback? How do I measure my effectiveness against that feedback that I've had? You know, I might be um, really quiet. I might not speak out. I might um, not be very good at managing risk. I might not have the right sort of approach to presentation. I might speak really quickly or I might speak really slow. How am I responding to people's feedback and how am I being measured against that? So I think when back in the day when when I was in the in the system integration space, you know, your training would be, hey, go buy the book, we'll pay for the exam, study it in your own time, knock yourself out. Go go to a conference and and go and you know go to the community conferences on the weekend. Go and go to one of the Microsoft events. Go and listen to the training. Mm-hmm. Training and certifications I think are an essential, but at the same time I don't think they necessarily mean you immediately know how to use what you've been taught. They're quite generic. You know, and I think the further up the food the food chain you get and the further the with the experience that you have, you find that actually you can pass the exams pretty easily from just watching the the trainer video um over yeah. the course of a couple of days before the exam, if that makes sense. So for for me, I think working for a big four organization, big four organizations have a very different approach to in my experience anyway, from um what the system integrators tend to do. So in big four organizations, there's an enormous focus on you being a leader and you, regardless of the grade that you come in at, you know, regardless if you're at the beginning of your career or right at the top of your career, there's a huge focus on you leading, driving. And um, bear in mind, big four organizations, they're organizations built in relationships. So yeah. when I'm bringing people in, I'm looking at 60% of their skills mm-hmm. need to be aimed at technology. You need to understand the product. You need to understand the capabilities of it. You need to be kept up to date. You need to know how to translate a client's problem into a solution using that technology. You need to be able to shape and understand, do I use dynamics? Do I use power platform? Do I use case management? Do I use sales? Do I use a combination of sales? You need to understand the the problem you're solving. You need to understand the context that you're trying to solve the problem. You need to understand the bigger picture of the client's problem domain their industry, the, the way in which that industry works, the focuses that, that, and, the, and the pressures that that client may have. Um, and, and, and when I'm looking for people, I'm looking at, as I say, 60% of their skills to be in that technology space, but then 40% of their skills to be, how do you go about building a relationship with someone? Yeah, Because you know, let's face it, consulting, you're, you're always sort of, I, I used to use this phrase, and it's terrible, but you're always selling in the sense yeah. that you're always presenting oh. you're always on stage you know you're 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 the lead singer and you're only as good as your last song and mm. you have to constantly be thinking about okay what is this person that I'm presenting to thinking what are their problems how do i need to solve those problems and then the wider picture of okay we this person is about to invest a significant amount of money into a project and you know, I might be a leader on that project, or I might be someone delivering as a uh, part of the project. There might be someone that's just literally building power behind dashboards all day, or mm-hmm. someone that's building flows. Every member of that team has a role to play in providing value to the client and providing value in what they do. And that might be as basic as someone comes up to them in the, you know, when they're delivering a solution, ask them a question, someone from the customer or even a team member. How is that person then responding? Because there's a balance there of you are providing internal consultancy to your colleague, and that colleague might not know about the technology that you're using. How do you yeah. foster and share ideas? Equally, you might be providing a solution to your customer. That customer may have never seen any of the technology that you're using ever. And you might start using terms like, oh, yeah, we put a solution in for that, and I've got a table for this and a, and a field for that. They have no idea what you're talking about. And, and, and the quicker you realize that and recognize that and understand how to engage with someone, in a meaningful way, um, the better. So 40% of the skills that I'm looking for are those true yeah. consultancy skills, the personal skills, the interpersonal um, ability to build relationships and be confident and credible when having a conversation with someone and not be, um, what's the word? Not be, not be necessarily, I was going to say introverted, but it's not the term. It's, it's, it's not be sort of... Um, like if you don't know the answer, 
say you don't know the answer, go and find out. You know, you're the consultant. Go and yeah. go and prove yourself. Um, don't be scared to do that. Definitely do not um, just make something up and, and hope for the best because you know ho- hope isn't hope is not a plan. Yeah, exactly. Mike, it's an interesting conversation. We've already run out of time, as in, and I feel like there's a lot more I'd like to, to to discuss with you. But thank you so much for coming on the show. You're very welcome. It's good to good to it's good to be here. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening. I'm your host, business application MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 Guy. If there's a guest you'd like to see on the show, please message me on LinkedIn. If you want to be a supporter of the show, please check out buymeacoffee.com forward slash NZ365 Guy. Stay safe out there and shoot for the stars.